please, uh, the introduction to my sermon today is going to be this short video clip that I'd like you to watch as we show it right now. Our life is a story. It has a beginning and an end. Each of its volumes are filled with tales of great victory and disappointing failure. But one thing is certain. Those moments shape who we are in the present, and they affect our decisions for the future. Many times what stands out from those moments are the failures. Time reveals our numerous unkept resolutions and promises. We resolve to lose those extra pounds, quit that addiction, or become more devout in our faith. But these resolutions often prove difficult to achieve. Perhaps the key to overcoming our struggles lies not in the resolution, but in the motives which drive us. We cannot achieve anything without Christ's guiding hand. His word tells us, whatever you do, do you work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men. Our success does not come from just one decision to change. It comes from a daily decision to walk with him. What if today we made a resolution that mattered? What if we resolved to invest more time into our families? To love our neighbor as ourselves, To right our wrongs? To pray not at God, but to God? To give without expectation of receiving? What if we made a resolution to become more like Christ. And today, let us make a resolution to struggle for God's glory and not our own. Even though the future is still unwritten, our story has only just begun. All right, open your Bibles, please, to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3, and I originally was going to call this message, What If?, but I decided to change the what if to as if. And so I might invite you to take your bulletin outline there. In the center of, of your bulletin, there's an outline. And I invite you to circle the what if. Circle the what if in the outline. As you notice, I have the as if already underlined for you. And that's our big idea. Our big idea for today is there on the top of your bulletin. I'd like you to say it together with me, all right? And I can think about it, and that this is the key. This is the key to the message today. Let's say it out loud together. What if I live my life this new year as if I were living it for the Lord, not for myself? One more time. What if I live my life this new year as if I were living it for the Lord and not for myself? You say, well, where's that in the Bible? Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. And whatever you do, whatever you do, do it hardly as if you were doing it for the Lord and not for men. Whatever you do, Colossians 3, 23. Do it heartily. And I want to spell that word for you, H-E-A-R-T-I-L-Y. You say, well, I can spell. Why'd you spell it? Some people don't seem to be able to. They read that verse, whatever you do, hardly do it, and they hardly do anything. That's sad truth. That's the sad truth. They do the least they can to get by. So they hardly do anything. The verse says, do it heartily, with all your heart. Give it your best. Now, what would that look like? 
what if I live my life this new year? So I'd like to take those six, seven things from the video clip and just address them with you. And there are many more, all right? I was kind to you today, and I didn't put 25 down there, all right? But I knew New Year's Day, that would not be a smart I think, to do. So seven's a perfect number. So let's talk briefly about each one, recognizing we could talk a long time about each one, all right? If I live my life this new year as if I were living it for the Lord and not for myself, I would, number one, invest more time in my family. Invest more time in my family. Now, notice the first word, which is invest. Invest. We didn't say spend. I didn't say spend more time with my family. I said invest. Now, what's the difference between investing and spending? Well, if you feel like you're spending it, then it can be gone or wasted, right? Yeah. If you spend something, you can spend it and it's gone. But if you look at it as an investment, if you're investing it, then it's not gone. It's not a waste of my time then. Now, sadly, a lot of men are guilty of living their whole lives for their jobs. And that's because they, they choose to get their identity from their job. And they neglect many other things in their life, including their families, for the job. But it's not a trite cliche, even though you've heard it probably uh, several dozen times, that no one ever says on their deathbed, I wish I'd spent more time at work. That's not a trite cliche. Uh, the original quote was, I wish I spent more time at the office, but not everybody works in an office. So no, nobody says that on their deathbed. I wish I'd spent more time at work. What, are the, what do people always say if they say something like that on their deathbed? I wish I'd spent more time with my family, right? That's what people say. So if you don't want to say that on your deathbed, then do something about it now, whatever that looks like for you. And I'm not here to tell you how it's going to work in every family because every family is different. I got that. I understand that. Okay? Not everybody lives in a family unit. We have people who live by themselves. And so what about those folks? Well, let me ask you a question. What about your church family? Think about this, and you can substitute for the family member, you know, church family, but think about this question. Would you like to have a closer relationship to your family members? Just think about that. Would you like to have a closer relationship to your family members, husband, to your wife, father, mother, son, daughter, brother, sister, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, whomever? You can. You can have a closer relationship if you will invest one thing. What is that? Time. Time. That's it. Time is the most precious commodity all human beings have. Time is worth more than dollars. Now, I know some people, you know, they take the time and they make it worth so many dollars etc cetera, etc cetera. but i'm talking about in family relationships your children don't want the money they'd rather have your time than your money at least till they reach a certain age <laughs> T 
Time is the soil. Someone said this. Time is the soil in which relationships can grow and blossom. Time is the soil in which relationships can grow and blossom. Everything takes time, and we human beings don't like that because we like it. We want it tomorrow or yesterday, right? Not tomorrow. We want it now or yesterday. Somebody says, I'll have it for you tomorrow. That's not good enough. Oftentimes. But everything is a process. Everything in life is a process. By the way, the first institution that God ordained was what? The family. The family. The first institution. And by the way, that's why, and I'm not preaching on this today, but I, I recognize it, and you ought to as well. That's why the family is under such attack by Satan and the whole society. Okay? That's why. You see, in fact, in marriage, God says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And when you go to Ephesians chapter 5, the relationship between husband and wife is supposed to be to the world, to the unsaved world, a picture of Christ's love for the church, right? And once again, that's why Satan hates it. He doesn't want the world to know that Jesus Christ loves them and died for them. He doesn't want you to know that Jesus Christ loves you and died for you. And by the way, no matter what your human family is like, you can be a member of God's forever family if you will put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ because John 1.12 says, as many as receive him, the Lord Jesus Christ, to those people he gave the power to become the children of God, even to those who believe on his name. So you can become a member of God's family. And you'll never be kicked out of that family. God gives you eternal life, which lasts forever. But you have to ask for it. You don't just get it automatically. And so, number one, I would invest more time in my family. Number two, if I live my life this new year as if I were living it for the Lord, I would love my neighbor as myself. I would love my neighbor as myself. You say, where's that in the Bible? Well, it's all through the New Testament. Every time they asked Jesus about the greatest commandment, you know, what's the greatest commandment? He would say the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. And then he would say the second, and by the way, isn't this interesting? They never asked Jesus what the second one was. You ever think about that? They never did. They always said, Master, what's the great commandment? He could have stopped after that first commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. He would answer the question. But he always said, and the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. I just picked one for the, for the PowerPoint, Mark 12, 31. He said, the second most important command is this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. So how can I do this? How can I do this? Well, here's the question, and I'll, I'll entertain a few answers from the audience. How do we love ourselves? Just go ahead. How, how do we love ourselves? We spend money on ourselves, okay? What else do we do for ourselves now? Um, forget your neighbor for a minute. What do we do? How do we show our love for ourselves? What? We feed ourselves, okay? What else? What do we do for ourselves? Clothe ourselves. What else? Put a roof over our head. Shelter ourselves. We read God's word. See, there's a lot of ways we love ourselves, right? And here's where this gets dicey and convicting, and we don't even deal with it. Most We don't deal with this. That's why I'm, I'm taking a moment to force everybody to deal with it. What's it? What in the world does it look like to love your neighbor as yourself? Now, if Jesus didn't mean it, he wouldn't have said it over and over. And go home and, you know, check this out today and look in the Gospels. 
And if you have a reference Bible, you can just go to one of these passages that has it, and then it'll tell you the other ones, okay? Greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind. Second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. And by the way, do you, do you ever think about this? What are, what are the most famous, quote, list of commandments in the Bible? What are they called? Ten commandments. And you could say that the first one Jesus gave is part of the Ten Commandments, right? But the second one here, love your neighbor as yourself, while the principles are in the other Ten Commandments, that's not one of the Ten Commandments. Did you ever think about that? He didn't say, the second most important one is, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not do this. He didn't say that. He said, love your neighbor as yourself. So if I'm going to live my life as if I were living for the Lord, then I'd love my neighbor as myself, and I'd figure out what that looks like, and I'd try to do it. Number three, I would right my wrongs. I would right my wrongs. Let's get some scriptures before we kind of unpack this. Matthew 5, 23, 24. So when you offer your gift to God at the altar and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar. First go and make peace with that person and then come and offer your gift. What's that mean? It means what it says. It means when you go to church, I'll put it in our, that was in that, that day they offered gifts at the temple, okay? And they took them to the altar. In our vernacular today, it'd be when you go to church to worship. And you're going to give God your worship. And you remember that there's a problem. Your brother or sister has something against you. You say, well, I'm not sure if they do or not, because I remember this one incident. Oh, I got bad news for you. If you remember it, they remember it. And they may even remember it if you don't. So you may have to, if there's ever any doubt, you may have to ask. And that gets, that gets so hard, doesn't it? That's dangerous. Because nobody wants to open themselves to get blasted. I understand that. I got it. Nobody said the Christian life was easy, by the way. We're not, we're not here preaching the health and wealth gospel, okay? Matthew 5, 44, Jesus, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. See, Jesus said, look, it's no big deal if you love the people who love you back, because that's easy, anybody can do that, right? I mean, somebody love you back, well, you know, that makes it easy. But if somebody's not loving you back, and you love them, and you bless them, and you pray for them. And by the way, I, I understand how hard this is. I, I got it, okay? God's, God continues to teach me, and I've had to practice this. I drove by somebody's house for months and prayed for that person and i didn't feel like it at all and everybody now wants to know who was it none of your business none of you okay but i did it because god convicted me of it fact, for a time i would drive out from my house the other direction so i didn't have to drive by that person's house it did I hope that you never have I hope that you never have to come to church and say, Oh, I gotta wait till so and so's there so I can sit on the other side of the church from them. People do that. Yeah. I got bad news for you. Matthew six fourteen. Yes, if you forgive others for their sins, your father in heaven will also forgive you for your sins. 15, but if you don't forgive others, your Father in heaven will not forgive your sin. You say, what's that mean? 
It means what it says. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mark 11.25, but when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against. Mark 11.25, but when you are praying, first forgive anyone you're holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Now, I understand that it's difficult theologically to unpack that. I got it. I understand that. And I can explain it to you, but it would take a long time. I can, just, I'll, I can concisely put it this way. It's not going to satisfy everybody. God's love for us is unconditional. Okay? Unconditional love. But if you go to God asking for forgiveness and you know that you have something in your heart against somebody else that you don't want to let go of, God's, you're not in a position then to ask for God to forgive you. So God can't forgive you. Okay? Because you don't have a heart that's repentant and right with God. That's, that's in a nutshell what that means. Okay, And there's a lot more to it than that. That's why the Apostle Paul said this in Acts 24, 16. And this is a scripture verse that I would suggest that even though I have it on the I don't, I don't have it on the screen for you. The Holy Spirit reminded me of this. So open your Bibles to Acts 24, 16. And I would suggest that you mark this down. And in the, in the margin, I would suggest you write two words. And then ask God this year to help you to work at this. And this is all part of this point on writing our wrongs. Acts 24, 16, the Apostle Paul said, and this is something I work at. Now, different translations say it different ways. King James says, herein do I exercise myself. To always keep my conscience clear toward God and toward men. Now, most people, if they're trying to be spiritually minded, will try to keep their conscience clear with God. When God's Holy Spirit convicts them of something, they'll ask God to forgive them, and they'll name it to God, and that's the way we do it. We don't just say, God, forgive my sins. We say, God, Forgive me for lying, for stealing, for cheating, for lusting, for losing my temper. We name it, okay? Name it to God. You say, doesn't God know what it is? Yes, but he wants you to know it. All right? And the Greek word in 1 John 1, 9 for confess my sins is hamalageo, which means say the same thing as God, okay? I, I need to say the same thing as God about my sin. So God, I, I understand that this is sin, that losing my temper and Blowing off at somebody is my sin. I can't just justify it by saying, well, that's the way God made me. I just can't help myself. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Is it okay for a murderer to say, oh, that's just what I do. I just murder people. No. But it's always it's never okay for somebody else, but it's always okay for me if I want to make that excuse, right? That's how we are. So we, we work at keeping our conscience clear toward God, but how do we keep it clear toward man? And I wrote in my Bible there, clear conscience, two words, clear conscience. And here's what the Apostle Paul is saying when he says this, when he says, herein I exercise myself. Paul is saying this, I work at, spiritually speaking, I work at making sure that I always have a clear conscience with God, my sins are confessed to God, and I watch, watch the man part. And I make sure that there's no person that I can remember that could say, and have it be the truth, that man Paul offended me and never came back and made it right. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I work at making sure that there's nobody that's on the earth that can say that man Paul offended me and never came back and tried to make it right. Now, let me just help you out here. And I preached a whole six-week series on forgiveness, so I understand it's a huge, complex subject. Just because you ask somebody's forgiveness doesn't mean that they're going to love you and everything's going to be hunky-dory and they're going to want to go out and have coffee with you or whatever, okay? I'm not saying that it has to be that way, but I'm saying as much as is in your power, okay? So 
like and here's the way to ask forgiveness by the way here's the here's the way don't just say i'm sorry because that that's you know meaningless most of the time say i'm i was wrong please forgive me i was wrong that it's not blaming the other person and then please forgive me now they may say no and by the way if they do then it's now on them you have done the best you can to ask their forgiveness and take blame, take the responsibility. And we don't like to do that. Most of the time we like to say, well, it wasn't really my fault. It was their fault. Most of their fault. I had a little bit of fault. This is something I work at. And by the way, you say, well, Pastor Bob, I don't know if there's anybody like that. Well, here's all you need to do then. You just need to pray and say, God, if there's some person that I've offended that things aren't right between me and that person, uh, would you please bring that to my memory? Remind me of it. And I would make the confession only as broad as the offense. In other words, that means you don't have to tell the whole group of people. You'd, you'd talk to the person that was wrong. Number four, if I'm going to live my life as if I were living it for God, I would pray to God, not at God. Pray to God. Now, you say, what's that mean? Well, as I was thinking about that, Matthew 6, 6, and 7, notice these scriptures. When you pray, not if you pray, but when you pray, you should go into your room and close the door and pray to your Father who cannot be seen. Your Father can see what is done in secret, and He will reward you. And when you pray, don't be like those people who don't know God. See, those people pray at God. They continue saying things that mean nothing, thinking God will hear them because of their many words. In other words, a lot of people give, the Bible says, don't use vain repetition. That just means just saying a bunch of words, okay? Don't just say repetitious, recited prayers. Let that, a, a recited prayer can be okay for a little child, a tiny little toddler, when you're teaching them to pray, okay? God is great. God is good. Thank the Father for this food. Amen. My mother and father taught us to pray that, you know, when we were two and three. But God says, I'm not interested in just hearing a bunch of words, a bunch of vain repetition that you say over and over just to get brownie points with God or impress other people. So what does praying to God mean? Here's what it means. It means talking to God like he was your loving father, which he is. Now, if you grew up in life without a loving father, I understand that can be hard for you to have a model. I got that. I understand that. Nevertheless, God is your loving father. That's why in the Lord's Prayer, what did Jesus say to his disciples? They should start the prayer out with what the words are. Huh? Our Father, our Father, our Father. And God is a loving Father if, if, He's always loving, but He's a Father to you if you have become a member of His family by personally accepting His Son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and Savior. And as your father, God says he'll give good, good gifts and he'll never leave you or forsake you. Number five, if I'm going to live for the Lord as if I was living for God, not for people, myself, then I would give without expecting anything back. Give without expecting anything back. Luke 14, 13 and 14, Jesus Christ is speaking here about inviting people to to a feast and banquets and he gives this uh little admonition he says when you give a feast don't just invite you know everybody that you know your rich friends and your family and everything because because they can return the favor and pay you back and so on but he said instead when you give a feast invite the poor the crippled the lame and the blind then you'll be blessed because they have nothing that cannot pay you back but you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the just 
Give without expecting anything back. That's not easy, is it? By the way, you should never loan somebody any money if you can't afford to not get it back. Did you hear what I said? You should never afford to loan you should never loan anybody any money if you cannot afford to not get it back. And if if that's going to cause a consequence not getting it back, don't loan it. Because the relationship is worth a whole lot more than the money. Now, if it's a loan and they say they're going to pay you back and you can afford to, to lose it, then you can loan it, okay? But give without expecting anything back. By the way, that's how Jesus died on the cross. Did you know that? Jesus died on the cross, and the Bible says that he died for our sins. I understand that. But Jesus, when he died, when he gave his life for you and me, he did not say, well, Father, I'm going to do this if you'll guarantee me so many people will believe in me. Did he? No. In fact, you know what he said about the people who nailed him to the cross? What did he say about those people? Forgive them. Forgive them. Yeah. Forgive them. You say, I'm not Jesus. Well, that's why we have number six. We need to try to become more like Jesus. Become more like Christ, both in our being and in our doing. In our being, Philippians 2, 5, in your lives, think and act like Jesus Christ. Christ himself was like God in everything. But he did not think being equal with God something to be used for his benefit. But he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. He was born to be a man, became like a servant. When he's living as a man, he humbled himself, was fully obedient to God, even when that caused his death, death on a cross. So when you and I become more like Christ, then we begin to think like Christ. And Jesus Christ was obedient even unto death. Nobody likes to think about dying. Jesus didn't like to think about dying. That's why in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed. He, he sweated great drops of blood. He prayed and said, God, if it's possible, let this cup pass for me. But not my will, thy will be done. Jesus did that for you, for me. He died on the cross for my sins, for your sins. So we become more like Christ in our being, in our thinking. By the way, if you want to think like Christ, then he wrote the Bible through his spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit wrote the Bible. So if you want to think like Christ, then you got to know what this says. You say, well, I don't understand it. Well, then find a translation you can understand. There's plenty of them out there, all right? And if you want a recommendation, come to me, and I'll give you several recommendations, all right? We have some, some NLT New Testament, some paperbacks right in the lobby there. They're free. You can have one, or I'll give it to you this morning. So it's not a good excuse anymore back in the day when all we had was one translation of the Bible. You know, it was in kind of Shakespearean English. People say, well, I can't understand that. We don't have, that's not an excuse anymore. It's valid. Okay. So if you want to think like Christ, then you have to know what he thinks like. And that's in here. Become more like Christ. By the way, did you ever stop to think about this? Even though Jesus was the Son of God, he needed, watch this, he needed to, because he wouldn't have done it if he didn't need to, he needed to spend time with his Father in prayer and go through the Gospels, if you haven't done it yet, and read how many times it says, Jesus got up a great while before day and he went out and prayed. He went out to pray. He went out to pray. You want to become like Christ, then pray more. Then doing, John 13, 15, Jesus said, I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. He had just washed their feet. And he wasn't saying to you and me that you should start washing feet in church. <laughs> I'm sorry. 
if you if you came from a church that did that and you like to do that, that's wonderful. But let's just get honest about it. It's really kind of phony baloney because we all know, because people told me this, who went to those churches. You know what they did? Everybody made sure they did before they went to church when there was foot washing. They all washed their feet. So the people wouldn't have to smell their stinky feet. How phony is that? Why did Jesus wash the disciples' feet? Because they needed it. They were dirty. They were dusty from the road, and nobody else was willing to take the towel and become like a servant. And that's what it's saying. Be willing to become like a servant, willing to wash whatever, okay? Scrub the toilets or do whatever's needed, okay? So Jesus said, I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant of all. Finally, number seven, I'll glorify God, not myself. Now, I want to show you 1 Corinthians 10, 31, which many people have memorized, but I want you to notice it with 32 and 33, okay? Because 33 is significant. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Don't give offense to Jews or Gentiles or the church of God, okay? Paul says, don't, don't, don't go offending people. Just as I also try to please everybody in every way. Now watch why. I'm not trying to do what is good for me, but what is good for most people. Now watch the last words. So they can be saved. Paul said, I'm trying to live my life in such a way so that I'm not an offense, so that as the gospel's given, people aren't going to use me as their excuse for not getting saved. Okay? This has nothing to do with political correctness or any of that junk. He's not talking about that. He's talking about trying to be gracious. It's what, it's what Chuck Swindoll calls being a winsome witness. We don't use the word winsome, but you'll understand what that means, right? Being a gracious witness. Yeah. I am not trying just to please myself, but I'm trying to do the, the best I can for God to glorify him so that people will see my life and they'll want to be saved. How many people have wanted to be saved because they've seen your life? Not, not just this past year, but your life, in your life. Let's say our big idea one last time as we close. All right, say it together. What if I live my life this new year as if I were living it for the Lord and not for myself? Let's ask God to help us to do that. As we bow our heads and hearts, please, for a closing word of prayer. Let me ask you this simple question. If you were to die today, if you were to die today, you say, I'm not planning to die today, Pastor Bill. I understand that nobody is. Nobody is planning to die today, but will there not be people die today? Yes, there will. Sadly, there'll be people who will die today. And most of those people are not planning on it. I'm not talking about people with terminal illnesses either. I'm just talking about accidents. There'll be millions of cars on the highway this holiday weekend, right? Some people will sadly die. I'm not glad about that, but I'm just asking you to think about yourself. If you were to die today, can you say, yes, I know that if I were to die today, I would be absent from this body. I'd be present with God in heaven. Do you know that for sure? Now, God says he wants you to know it, all right? He wants you to know it. So if you do not know it, but you'd say, well, I'd like to know that I have a guaranteed reservation to heaven. I'd like to know that I have eternal life. I'd like to know that my sins are forgiven, that Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. Then I invite you right now from your heart of hearts to God to pray silently quietly this prayer just follow me as i pray and you pray it silently there to god heavenly father thank you for sending jesus just silently pray this to god thank you for sending jesus to die on the cross for my sin i ask him now to come into my life forgive my sins 
and make me your child. Thank you for making me a member of your family. Help me now to live my life for you, not myself. And help me to tell someone else what I've done here today. In Jesus' name I pray. With our heads still bowed and eyes still closed. If you prayed that prayer with me a moment ago and meant it, would you lift your hand right now? By that raised hand, you're saying, yes, I prayed today to invite Jesus Christ to become my Lord and Savior. Thank you. Yes, I see your hand. Anyone else? All right, Christian friend, let me ask you a question. God's spoken to your heart, and there's some things there that you know that he wants you to take care of today. I don't need to recite the list again. You have the list in front of you. But if God's spoken to you about one or more of those things on the list, you say, Pastor Bill, pray for me that with God's help, I'll do what his Holy Spirit told me to do as a Christian. Soon. I'll do it today. I'll start. I won't wait till this year has passed. I'll begin now to work on those things God's spoken to me about today. Here's my hand. Pray for me as a Christian all over the church. Yes, God bless you and you and you and you. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this one who raised his hand that he's accepted Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. I pray for him that he, he'd understand the plan of salvation, the gospel, and what you've done for him today. And I pray for each one of us who have to decide how we're going to live this new year. Help us to live it as if we were living it for you and not for ourselves. Bless each person who raises their hand. And if there's people that we need to make things right with, help us to do that. And help us to do all that we can to keep our conscience clear, not only toward you, but toward others. Help our church this year to continue to reach out, to win souls to Christ, to give the good news of the gospel, to fulfill our mission, the reason that you have us here. Give you praise and thanks and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.